And this panel is really thinking, you know, all of this takes a lot of passion and devotion and, you know, sheer willpower from the community in VR to bring this space to life. Um, at some point, it also needs fund, uh, funding and fundraising. So um, this panel is really to get some of the people uh, on stage who have been putting um, dollars behind this space and to get their view on how it's developing and what they look for uh, when, they see com uh, when they see VR companies. So um, maybe we could kick off with just some introductions uh, of you guys. Avid, do you want to kick us sure. off? So um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Avid Larzada Duggan. I'm a general partner at GV, formerly known as Google Ventures. Um, we invest, we have made quite a few investments in, in VR both in Europe and in the US. Um, in Europe, we made an investment in a company called Resolution Games, um, which is mobile VR, sort of casual gaming, with actually Romain from Partech, we're both in that. Um, in the US, um, some of our investments include Jaunt VR, Emergent VR, Altspace, um, are some of the ones that we've invested in. Okay. Cool. Oh, hi, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm Romain Lavaux. I'm a general partner at uh, Partech, which is a transatlantic firm. I uh, started in San Francisco in uh, 82 and now uh, also based in Paris and in Berlin. Um, I personally joined three years ago uh, over from the other side. I was uh, funded by Partech for a few years uh, until my company was acquired by Dassault Systems. I was not in 3D, but got acquired by a 3D company, which was fun. Um, made, uh, made a few investments. Uh, our seventh generation of funds is uh, about 800 million, um, from which we dedicate about half to seed and early stage. And this is primarily where VR is today, and uh, the other half is for, uh, for growth capital. Uh, we've done four investments in this, uh, in this space so far. Uh, one was way too early, uh, in 2001, a company called Total Immersion, um, that was basically offering a mixed reality experience uh, and there was no real good killer use case. They worked with a few uh, broadcasters, uh, uh, resorts, uh, brands, but uh, they eventually died out of, um, out of growth, probably never passed the $10 million mark revenue. Uh, more recently, and hopefully more wisely, uh, three other investments. Um, so as David mentioned, uh, Resolution Games in, uh, in Stockholm. By the way, I've, I've tried this name on, a, on some of you uh, during lunch, and it's, it's little known. Um, if, if, we, if we tell you Tommy Palm, uh, it's, it's somewhat known as well. And when we say Candy Crush, then everyone knows about it. Uh, so that's all of the, the Candy Crush Saga team that uh, restarted a, a VR gaming studio. Uh, so we're excited about this. We'll probably uh, tell you more. There's another company uh, based in France uh, called uh, Gyroptic. Um, so I, I know a few uh, think that 360 degree video is not VR. Uh, I believe it's actually a, it's a cheap way into VR. Uh, and at least it's available today. Um, and the last one is called Sketchfab uh, in the US. Uh, studied in 3D modeling and now uh, basically a, a VR distribution platform for, uh, for 3D content. Right. Fine. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, my name is Sean Chang. I'm a principal at Vayner Capital. It's a new fund started by internet entrepreneur and investor Gary Vaynerchuk. We've invested in a lot of consumer and enterprise in the past, such as Snapchat, Medium, Ship, Luxvelle. And we've done two investments within virtual reality. We did one within distribution called Little Star, again, within the uh, 360 video space. We see it as a, a fantastic appetizer. And um, we've also done a in-VR, for VR content creation and storytelling tool called Visionary VR, uh, which is the same team that also produces and manages the virtual reality Los Angeles uh, Expo community. Right, awesome. And just to make sure we keep this relevant and on topic for you guys, it'd be great to get a sense of who's actually in the audience. So I mean, raise your hands if you're working full-time in VR. So your job is full-time. Okay, cool. And how many people are actually working on their own company? So they're a founder of a company. Okay, awesome. Who's looking to raise money? Okay, good, right. 
Okay, so I think, I think we should probably kick that off then. So, um, you know, some experienced investors, but VR is a very new space, right? So you can't apply the same, you know, looking at other companies in the space. There isn't necessarily the same pattern recognition around the particular market. So when an entrepreneur in this space comes along, how do you actually evaluate that investment opportunity? And is, how does it differ from a standard company that comes along? Sure. So in a way, it's very similar to any other company. So we look at team, we look at product, um, we look at market. The differences are in the nuances of it. Biggest nuance is the market size today. Um, there's really not that big of a market as we all know. And so the emphasis goes on to the team and the product. Um, and I think for us, as for me, as I look at, at these companies, the team is extremely important for a slew of reasons. One is, looking for a team that can be resilient throughout the, the time where the market is going to come to them. So what does that mean is we're looking for potentially people with experience in previous lives where this has happened to them. If I refer to resolution games, again, Tommy Palm did a number of um, companies in mobile very early on and so has had that experience of being very early in an industry um, and being able to to go through that. So, so that's um, extremely important. And then I think we evaluate it differently in terms of um, if you slice the, the market in sort of three broad sectors of you have the HMDs, you have the software, and then you have the content, you look at these and evaluate these in a, in a different fashion with specific criteria there. Mm. And, and Roman, I mean, are you seeing common mistakes that when founders come in, they're just pitching it slightly wrong, or how, how, what are you seeing when people come along? I think, I think, I mean, the mistakes that we can see during pitches are the same whether it's VR or not, um, and they would come down to um, basically ignoring your competition. I mean, there's always competition. Um, sometimes the competition is like doing nothing or not choosing your product or staying with what you have, but, um, but it's especially important in an, in an industry like this where most of the companies are still unknown. So there's not been a lot of deals, not been a lot of announcements. So most products are still in a stealth mode. And so when we ask an entrepreneur and we say, who are you competing with? And they say, no one, we're kind of unique and blah, blah, blah. Uh, that's, that's a mistake, it's never true. And, and we'll dig and we'll find competition. Um, so that, that's one. The second one is, um, is not being ambitious enough. Um, so like some people would, satisfy, uh, would be satisfied with a market size of let's say 500 million, which is about the market size of today uh, for VR gaming. Um, and, and when we do our own math, we know a good company, a really good one will take one or 2% market share. So if you do the math, it's not gonna be a, a very large company. And so we want, we want founders that are very ambitious uh, we know there's a lot of chance it will not work, but at least if you don't have this ambition, it will never work. Yeah. And Sean, what's, what's your view on the money question, business model, when entrepreneurs come in? Are you more looking to see someone who can execute, get a great product into a potential market? Or do they need to come and say, hey, look, we think we're going to make money through advertising. We think we're going to sell it at this price. How do they address that question? Uh, I think for, for Vayner, we've... we've been very comfortable with ambiguity. I would say a dozen of our uh, investments from this last portfolio company were pre-product. And uh, given that virtual reality is so young and the question is, is do you swim uh, before the wave is coming or do you come a little bit later uh, as the moment momentum starts to build? And so we look for founders that uh, are, have foresight and have the ability to continue to iterate their hypotheses off of whatever the macro trends are. And so uh, if it is being scrappy and finding smaller revenue streams over the short term in order to uh, have some form of cash flow, great. If they're uh, more than willing to move across the river and pay you know, a fourth of the price per square foot, uh, I, I was uh, astonished by some of the prices that uh, the startups and founders that you guys have to pay out here, uh, 70, 120 uh, you know, pounds per square foot is, uh, is a lot, uh, especially to bear over the next few months, given that I, I actually think that it won't actually hit critical mass until uh, potentially second half of 2018. And so can you not die 
is, uh, is often the question that is very open-ended that I love asking potential founders because many of them, uh, if they don't even have that in their sights, there's no urgency and there, there is no foresight uh, to be able to adapt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Roman, you had some thoughts on that topic, on the business model? Yeah, there's um, what well, are different categories, like hardware companies have an obvious business model, so it's, uh, it's a lot easier. Um, it's true that for the, the content part, uh, distribution is still unclear. Um, so whether it's gonna be a freemium advertisement, like advertisement in VR is not an easy one. Um, it might be uh, too intrusive, uh, I mean, because it's all about the user experience, so we don't wanna touch that too much. Um, I think we, we it's, it's just like in messaging platform or thing like this, at a point you're able to take that leap and say, um, if, if it takes off, then I will find a way to monetize. Um, the way we see it is we don't need to check that box when we invest, um, but we invest on momentum. And so a hardware company needs to show us, we're, we're, we're wired, our brains are wired to kind of draw exponential curves from what you're showing us. And so we need to have those indicators. Uh, it could be early sales, it could be pre-orders. Um, if you are in the content space, uh, it could be number of uh, monthly users, uh, connections, actions, whatever M marks of interest that we can use to, uh, to feel like there's something, um, something around your product. But it's, it's way too early to assume or to assess uh, acquisition cost of users, uh, retention, lifetime value, all those things. All of the usual KPIs that we have when, even on mobile apps, we don't have them today in VR, so it makes it very difficult, which might be an explanation why there's not a lot of us in this room today. It's, yeah. it's still, it's still a, a space where there, there are not a lot of investors. Yeah, and Avid, I mean, GV and also Google is, uh, you know, it's clearly committed to this space and is investing both time and money. Um, are we at a point now, do, do you think there's too few uh, venture dollars chasing great companies or too much at the moment? Um, I, I don't think there's too few. I don't think there's too much. I think the, the way to look at it is what's interesting is you see in deals today, in VR deals, a lot of VCs together. Um, so there's a lot of syndicates happening, um, even for not that huge amount of investments, which is part of the challenge, I think, as an entrepreneur today is there's a complexity that comes from having multiple VCs that you have to corral together to get a deal done. And that is partly a reflection of how early the, the market is and um, some of the, uh, the sort of need or, or fear potentially of uh, venture capitalists and partners to put in too much money in case of losing that capital. And so sy larger syndicates get formed in VR compared to other sectors where you might see one or two VCs get together and swoop a deal away. Um, so, um, and then, you know, the, the geography thing which we were talking about before, um, I think if you look at the activity in the US, and you're probably very well placed to talk about it, you'll see m more fundraising activity around VR in the US. Um, potentially, again, that may be due to the fact that there's the level of risk taking at this point in time in VR is higher. You have more entrepreneurs that have turned into VCs, and so that appetite is there versus in Europe. Um, there's still a lot of sort of very financial focused VCs who may want to wait a bit longer before they expose themselves to get that level of risk. However, you know, we've, as you can see, we're making quite a few investments here as well and there's appetite for it. So I wouldn't be worried about there's not enough money. Um, I'd just be more focused on the right team, the right product yeah. and being able to do what we were talking about before, which is not just planning a year ahead, but two, three years ahead in this particular case. So yeah, maybe we can touch on the geography bit. I, th I guess most of the founders in the room are, are based here in Europe. Um, at Seacamp, we just backed a, a VR company. It's a great founder from Berlin, but he actually found himself going out to the US to go and find a lead VC there because he didn't, he felt like A, he would need, um, you know, a strong US lead, but also there wasn't necessarily enough kind of um, willing money in, in Europe. So 
maybe talk us through that. What would be your advice for a man? I mean, you have offices in Paris, Berlin, also the US. Is your advice to a, an entrepreneur here, hit the road, you know, go and do, go and do Silicon Valley, go and speak to the, you know, the veiners of this world in, in New York? Or should you just focus on building your company and keeping your fundraising activities uh, to here locally? Yeah, so I think, first, I think there's a, there's a, a big cultural difference in the way uh, we approach the funding of that, that type of market from the US and from Europe. Um, and so clearly, um, I think if I ask most of my colleagues in this industry, they haven't experienced VR. None of them have tried. And as you all know, I mean, if you haven't experienced it, you can't even talk about it. So not even making an investment decision is even further away. And so that's, that's, uh, that's the first problem. It's that, as I've said, most of the VC community in Europe still comes from the, the financial world. And so it's kind of uh, something new, kind of geeky for them and uh, don't want to touch it. The other thing is, um, there's a very different uh, perspective on market size, which I should touch a bit on. So the question you get in Europe is, what's your market size? The question you get in the US is, how fast is your market growing? So that's a very different perspective. And that tells you a lot about the, uh, the way the VCs will approach you. Now, it's not as easy as just taking an airplane ticket and uh, uh, meeting all of the Sending Road, uh, the Sand Hill, Sand Hill Road uh, VCs to get some money. That never works. I mean, that's my experience with all of the European companies is that you have to become American. So you have to open an office, uh, hire US people, um, sometimes flip your company over. And so that's not something you can do when you're raising money. So you're kind of stuck in a way. Uh, and it's going to be your goal to convince the local VCs to invest. Uh, it's not an industry where I see a lot of ways to, to get there. Now, there is an opportunity is that because it's an emerging field, there are a lot of big challenges to solve, big ones. And that's, that's also why it's not growing faster, is that we know there are technical hurdles, uh, user adoption, there are a lot of things. And so if some of you are on those two, onto those big problems and you can bring something very quickly to the industry, then any VC will invest. Um, and it could even be from the US. But we haven't seen a lot of kind of cross-border uh, investment in that space so far. Yeah. So I'm not too positive on that. Yeah. getting to the US at this stage. Yeah, and Sean, I mean, looking outside of maybe, I guess, for, for me, it feels like LA and SF seem to be the, the hubs or that's where a lot of the investment dollars have gone. Where do you see pockets of innovation? You know, why is someone like New York likely to, to bear fruit in terms of great companies? But also, if you look to Europe, is it London? Is it Berlin? Is it, you know, there's a lot of gaming talent in Scandinavia and, and Helsinki. Um, so wh where do you think those pockets of, of innovation are? And, you know, wh where are people congregating around this subject matter to, to create kind of share knowledge and, and grow big companies? Uh, in the U.S., I've found uh, a variety of groups that have been so beautifully created through grassroots initiatives. Uh, Women in VR as a Facebook group has thousands of participants, men and women, that are in support of bringing diversity because they believe that the more diverse a founding team is, the better the product will be. Uh, there's a Slack channel with also uh, thousands of people that are creator focused. Uh, a, a friend of mine just created uh, another initiative around sports uh, and thinking through some of the more difficult problems such as uh, business modeling and so um, I think online has been one of the more interesting areas. I, I've bounced around with other, other VCs uh, in New York talking about doing office hours within uh, Pluto VR uh, and, and just staying there or, or within big screen and having founders meet us in the metaverse to talk about their ideas uh, and we've had to travel so met most of the New York venture community that is interested in VR has had to be on a plane to go to SF, to Seattle, to LA. Uh, but I'm very encouraged over the last year, uh, local government has also been getting involved. And I think the university side, I, I'm, the reason why I'm here uh, is to also think through how the academics will become a part of the ecosystem and talent. So as founders in this audience, I'm sure one of the other primary concerns beyond funding is where do you find the builders of tomorrow? How do you find the people that can think in spatial audio, in not just from a post-production perspective, whether you come from television or movies, but how do you actually think in a brand new paradigm? And so 
Uh, IFAD founders move from New York uh, because they, they need to be closer to a talent pool that has had that type of exposure. Uh, and I believe both of you are completely right. There are, there are two types of people, both founder and investor. It's either you are a non-believer or you've actually tried VR. And it, it's the other, t there's no one else that kind of sits uh, uh, kind of in the middle. It's, it's pretty binary. And so, um, yeah, the universities have been great watering pool or watering holes, but I think much more can be done uh, even amongst founders to self-organize. Some of the best founders, uh, even on the coast uh, in the U.S., don't even know each other. And so even, you know, this week, making sure that they know of each other so that they can think about how to not only survive but thrive for the next uh, 24 months before... Yeah. Uh, there, there's another inflection point, I think. Also, I would say you can't underestimate the fact that, you know, Facebook, Oculus, Google, the movie studios happen to be in LA, in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And so that's where a lot of this knowledge, resources, money, talent is building this kind of ecosystem. So it's no wonder that a lot is happening there. Um, and we don't have an equivalent today here in Europe. Um, however, we have a lot of, and I think you mentioned that, gaming, very great gaming talent, great um, games companies that, and a lot of talent is coming out of those or even inside of those companies, um, projects are focused on VR and how you take that into VR. A lot of them are in the Nordics. Um, and, and I think we'll see that we saw that in mobile here. We had a, you know, in Europe was a hotbed for mobile and that's, partly why we've had so many success in mobile gaming as well. And so I think we can't underestimate that part of it for Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and again, time will tell, we're still very early and, and there will be some cross-pollination as that technology sort of, ha the exchange I mean, happens. I guess also, I mean, similar to, you know, uh, like previously where you've seen big music companies coming out of Europe, like the Spotify's or the SoundClouds or the Songkicks, where you've had big fashion companies coming out of, of London. I guess it kind of, you know, you need the talent from those industries as well as the, the tech talent and the distribution, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, cool, so Roman, let's talk about timing, because you mentioned you were, you were early in this space, um, which is, I, I would say, is probably a good badge of honor. Um, but both as a founder, and as an investor, sometimes if you're early, it's as good as being wrong. So how do you know as a founder, if you're, you're gonna go out and raise, you're gonna go and do it, you know, should you be waiting for a bit more adoption or you should, should you just be doubling down on, on what you're working on already? So uh, it's actually our primary risk uh, is to be too early. Um, I mean, if you, obviously we've all tried VR, uh, we, we're all convinced in this room this is the future. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when and potentially a, qu a question of how big. Uh, even though I don't have a lot of doubts about it. Um, so, and it's not just the future of entertainment, gaming, et cetera, it's the future of, of computing, um, in my opinion. But the, it's always a balance. When you, you meet a company in an emerging field, uh, there's the fear that you're about, you might be too early, there's a fear of, the fear of missing out. I mean, who would have thought Facebook would become what it, it has become? Uh, or Google. I mean, uh, uh, my best friend turned down uh, Larry and Sergey in his stands for class when they were looking for his first employee. And he made well, <laughs> he, he did okay. But, uh, and so th those, those are, I mean, those giants of tomorrow are extremely difficult to spot very early on. Um, so we have one advantage of our founders is that we don't get to choose just one. Uh, this is what makes your job very difficult is that uh, you're all in on just one, and you have to make it work. We can distribute our bets, but this is this is everything about betting, uh, betting on a team, betting on uh, an industry, and it may not work at all. Uh, so it's just at a point, um, kind of a gut feeling of a of a partnership that says, okay, well, we're going to back this team, and be all in behind them. We, we have one additional constraint that it put on our head, um, and I think is the case for most firms. We, don't, we never invest in two competing companies. So, so in the end, we, we still have, in, in a given vertical or, or subsector, we still have to choose one. So, so that makes it a bit stressful. So the easy answer is, of course, let's wait until you have traction and until the market's there and I can see a lot more gear VR out there, out there et cetera. The reality is if you wait too long, 
there are other VCs out there. So sometimes you just got to trust yourself and, uh, and trust the entrepreneurs. <laughs> Yeah, and so I mean, I guess also with, there's a lot of platform. We're still in the middle of the platform wars, right? No, no one's sure, you know, which platform to develop for. What's going to emerge first? Um, so, uh, as a, an investor, where where are you kind of hedging your bets? Is it going to be mobile going first, or is it going to be the the more tethered experiences? I know it's almost a kind of a cliched question, uh, you know, at conferences like this. But Sean, have you got a perspective on that? Yeah, I've been paying a lot of attention to uh, the engines. I think the engines actually will be one of the primary indicators and signals for what can be built and what, what's feasible. Uh, is it easier or harder? And also, uh, if any of you also own a, a Vive or a Rift, uh, you can see that uh, Oculus, for all the criticism that they've faced, uh, their onboarding is 10x better than a Vive. Uh, the store, in terms of shopping, uh, even discovery is being talked about after you know announcing a million users off of gear uh, is is better, but room scale and motion tracking and uh, the fidelity that you have within being able to control something within Vive is uh, so much better. It's a hundred x better <laughs> than what you can experience on many of the titles uh, on Rift right now. And so uh, the engine. Uh, the tools that get created, uh, I think, are, are some of the best ways that, uh, for founders that have thoughtful uh, opinions on where and, and uh, multiple hypotheses around what to do if, uh, if the market shifts. 90% of what's on Oculus right now is Unity. So what does that mean? And what happens if that shifts? I think the best founders have a plan for if and when uh, one of these tools overtakes another uh, and the types of products that will be created uh, much outside of both uh, entertainment and gaming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're actually seeing a lot of those engines or a lot of the platforms investing money themselves. What is their role in this? Um, you know, should they be investing more? Um, yeah, what, what are your thoughts on that, Avid? I'll, I'll use that to go back slightly in terms of what founders should do. Um, one thing I would recommend when it's so early uh, is to try to build relationships with these HMDs because there's not that many of you today. Um, there's a few of them that are battling trying to get the best content, the best software, the best tools and if you can build these relationships early on um, and continue, uh, continue with them, nurture them, then you're positioning yourself in the future, in a great in a, in a great way, um, and so that's you know if I were to prioritize, if I were a founder today, and I were to prioritize one thing is how do I build the right relationships with the big players in this ecosystem, and and that's part of their role as well. So they are looking for um, for great talent, for great content, for their um, for their hardware to get more um, people using it. As well as, as well as tools, um, and um, and I don't, you know, the other thing I think we need to um, put into context is how early are we? So Homa was very early in 2001, um, but if we look at it now, uh, we're looking at you know a time where price point has come down tremendously. So if you look at a Gear VR, we're talking about a hundred bucks that you pay for a Gear VR. Um, and potentially that goes lower and you can see cardboard. Now it's not the same as all the others, the HTC Vive and Rift, but still you're getting um, quite a decent um, experience out of it. It's portable, it's accessible, still a big sort of clunky thing you put on your head and that will change and I think that's also part of the usability of it. But um, again, it's becoming more and more accessible and the technology behind it because of the compute power that you mentioned, um, you know, the, the innovations in chips, um, the screens, the phones themselves, positional tracking, sensors, all of that, it's all there. Um, and so, yes, it is early in the sense that we don't have 100 million people on um, using VR, but, but the technology is there and the price point is becoming affordable for, you know, pretty much 
sort of a very large portion of the population with smartphones that are um, sort of the, the more premium smartphones. So if you think about roughly, let's say a billion people roughly will have smartphones that can support VR, you take 1% of that market, you're starting slowly to get there. Um, so again, I'm not saying we're not early, but I'm saying let's put it into context in terms of how early today is versus 10 years ago or five years ago. Um, and I'm very bullish in terms of how quickly it's going to move in the next two to three years and the adoption. And, and I think we're, we're in for a lot of development from whether it's Facebook or Google or Apple or Samsung um, in that field. Yeah, cool. So I think now I'm going to change tack slightly and just ask each of you, um, you know, about the categories that you're looking at. You know, we've, we've heard a lot this morning about games, about content. We also talked about sport and the hardware. Um, so maybe I could just go, starting with you, Sean, you know, what would you say are the kind of three areas that you're kind of, you know, looking most closely at? For virtual reality, I would say um, generally I, I've been looking at platform agnostic middleware and saying, uh, said more simply, um, uh, anything can, that can be valuable to multiple parties. And so it, it's, it's not to say that uh, we wouldn't do content but um, some examples of, of some resourceful founders that we've come across, uh, they've found high value or very difficult situations for uh, enterprise clients and created content for them. Uh, we found educational companies that have been finding uh, universities to partner with. So uh, more than anything, beyond thematics, I would say the resourcefulness of how do you survive and, and fight for your team uh, to go beyond that 12 or 24 months. So uh, middleware, uh, we also have been looking at spatial audio. Um, we've also been looking at uh, volumetric capture, both environments as well as people. How do we cross the chasm of you know, the uncanny valley of us looking all uh, uh, Minecrafty and actually being able to have a real conversation uh, and feeling as though you are truly there with, with someone else. Uh, those, yeah, those are the three yeah. that I would, I would look to. And Roman, you? So coming from a, from a software background, I tend to focus more on the, the soft part, part of it. So mostly content creation, uh, in fact. Um, but what's interesting is the more I dig into it and the more I, I live this with the entrepreneurs, I realize there are limiting factors uh, in, in the ecosystem and some very hard problems to solve. So I, I get um, related to those, uh, like for example, uh, which is more a hardware problem than a software problem. How do you capture uh, 3D, 360 VR content in real time? There's no, I mean, there's not even a device that has been invented. I mean, we would need a kind of, I've seen some projects from big firms with two eyes in every direction, a thing like this. Uh, but this notion of telepresence, which is one big uh, killer app for, for this space, um, is, is okay with, in the replay mode, but in, in live, it's very difficult. And it's a challenge across the whole chain. It's how do you capture, how do you process, even how, you, how do you stream those images, because they might be very heavy. Um, and, and in addition to this, because I'm a pretty long-term investor on VR, I'm like Avid, I'm very bullish on mobile, because ultimately mobile will get there in terms of uh, processing power and stuff. I mean, we have all mobile phones that have the power of our desktops from five years ago. So it's just a sliding scale. Um, so kind of projecting myself into uh, the next five years, uh, what does need to happen to enable the mobile VR to be as good, as, as uh, realistic as uh, the Vive and the Oculus of today. So, so more coming from content creation and, and software, and, but getting attracted and lured into uh, some of the hardware problems as well. Yeah, great. And lastly, Abbott. Um, so very quickly, we're, we're also more focused on the software um, and content side rather than the hardware. Um, mobile obviously is, is, mobile VR is a space that we look at a lot. Um, also, not dissimilar to what you said, the, anything that enables that um, emotional connectivity presence um, and recreates that. So whether it is in the form of communication, so Alt Space VR for, is an example of that. 
um, or being able to share moments, allowing people to share moments of their lives with each other. Um, and emergent VR is another example of that. Um, we've also uh, looked uh, and focused on cinematic VR through Jaunt, so some of the spaces we look at. But, but there's, you know, that's three of a lot of things that we, we um, look at applications in, whether it is, you know, tourism, travel, there's a lot that you can do there. Um, so it's very uh, green field today, cool. which is fun. Um, I'm going to open it up for qu uh, questions in, in a minute. Just one last question. So what's the thing, I'm sure you get pitched a lot of times, what's the one thing you don't want to see or you're like, oh, not another this? Or has that, has that time not arrived yet? Like I'm the Uber of VR? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. Um, well, VR is, is, I mean, we still have fresh eyes, honestly, on VR. It, it's, every project is new, every project is different, um, and it's fun. So uh, what I would not want to see is an entrepreneur that doesn't come with its demo. I mean, that's, that's something you need to experience, and I mean, w describing something on slides just doesn't give it justice. I would say uh, anyone that's approaching this new computing platform the same way that uh, they may have approached building a mobile or, or desktop focused company. Uh, I think being open and being humble to, to the fact that we all don't know where this new computing platform will go. Uh, I don't think uh, ideas that are, we're going to be just doing this for this, X for Y is, is typically a a fine starting point, but oftentimes it's lazy too. So uh, VR opens up a lot more possibilities. So the, also the ideas should should uh, have parity with that. Yeah. Great. Any final comments? No? I get excited by everything yeah. in <laughs> VR today. So awesome. Great. So do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, we've got one chap there. I think a microphone's on its way. Yeah. So I'm Eric from uh, Soft Kinetic. Why don't you like hardware? Looks like you are very focused on software. Cool. So question, yeah. Why don't you like hardware? Or maybe you like it, but you, you didn't find any good investment. You mean, don't, don't we like or do we like? So don't, what, what I heard is that you, you didn't invest in any hardware company. And uh, when, when uh, the question was uh, what you like to see, is it's mostly software based. So it's just that a matter of, uh, f from an investment perspective, it's a very different profile. So you get to have to invest a lot of money up front until you can have a feel for the market fit. Um, I, I've done a few hardware. I mean, f hardware is 15% of my portfolio. Um, but I, every time I had some sort of market fit, Kickstarter has been a great tool for me uh, to get a feel for, is there an appetite from the users? And when users are paying down Five hundred, a thousand dollar on a product that they will not receive before months or years. Sometimes um, that tells me something because they know. I mean, the, most of the users on Kickstarters are geeky and informed, um, and so they know this is something special that brings something. Um, and plus, we're sharing not only the risk, we're also sharing the costs with the users because uh, there will be all sort of other costs pre-production and fine-tuning and so, so it makes it hard for especially seed investment um, but otherwise um, I, I, it's true it's not as popular in Europe as it is in, uh, is in, in the US uh, to, to fund hardware companies um, but once you've done it a few times uh, and hopefully succeeded uh, it, it's 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 okay it's an ecosystem thing I mean we would never do hardware that's not connected to strong software IP or, or partners. I mean, just hardware for the sake of, the, of a hardware, it's too difficult. But if we, if we can see where, where it belongs and what's, what's going to be the, the connection with the big firms, um, it's, it's feasible, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Uh, another question here in the chat with the glasses. Um, hello. Uh, this is Ali coming from the... Gulf states, uh, Qatar exactly. Uh, I'm actually quite concerned about the investments, I mean, in VR companies that you make. Uh, have you ever looked at investments in the Middle East for VR companies, or have you ever uh, you know, studied how the potential for VR companies could, could actually be found in this area? Thanks. 
I think VR is borderless, so there's no reason not to look anywhere uh, for, for talent. Uh, personally, I haven't. Um, my focus is more, uh, more Europe and the US, uh, but I'd love to. So if, and if you have any good opportunities, I think we'll all be ready to, uh, to look at them. Okay, thank you. Cool, maybe two more questions, if we have them. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm Markus, hello. Thanks for the interesting panel. Um, yeah, I try to come from another side. Um, so, as all of us know, it costs more effort and it's more expensive to produce some content and software for VR comparing to other medias. Do you have um, an idea if there is a readiness from the customer side to pay also more for this content in the future, which is maybe an elementary element to get money back from these high investments? Are there some researches from your side or what's your personal opinion regarding this? Thanks. I would say for at least big media and agency and, and design firms, at least in New York, every major publisher is thinking about virtual reality. So if there are use cases or specific pieces of content that target painkillers versus vitamins, uh, I, would, I would suggest looking for those, those aspects. So if it's uh, a big automotive company creating a virtual reality experience and content uh, has massive implications for their workforce, whether it's owned or franchisees that are responsible for you know, generating a, a certain amount of sales. If it's you know, uh, content that may, may be uh, a nice to have for a, a brand, uh, it might not be as, as compelling and it might not necessarily continue or, or lead to uh, subsequent projects. But I know for a fact that uh, every post-production shop, every large media agency, whether it's uh, video or print, is thinking about how virtual reality extends and uh, re reimagines the existing IP that they have access to. Great. I think we have time for one more quick question, I think. Is there one more I can't see? No? Okay. Then I think we're... Um, oh, yeah. No. <laughs> Last question. Hi there, it's Chris from Steel Media. I know this is a VR conference, so I don't want to ruin this, but um, do you, are you guys looking at investments in the AR market? I've, I've read quite a few uh, people I respect who are thinking that AR might, might come from behind and outpace VR quite, quite quickly. Um, is, you know, obviously there's, there's areas where it kind of coalesces. And is, is AR something you're also looking at seriously now? Have it? We've respect. been focused mostly on VR. Um, where we would be happy to look at um, AR as well if we see something compelling, absolutely. It's not that we don't want to look at AR. It's just we've seen more in VR um, than we have in AR so far. Yeah, we've been paying attention to things like uh, Google's Project Tango as an indicator of, of what do founders and, and builders have access to right now. And so. Uh, I, I would also say most of our time has been spent in VR, but uh, I look forward to the day that every day will be a little bit different because uh, our daily lives are superimposed with all, all forms of other widgets and any information can, can come directly to us too. Cool, awesome. So I think we'll, we'll bring that to a conclusion. Um, just have a massive round of applause for the, uh, for the speakers today.